The Northwest Amazon is perhaps the best protected area so at the moment in the in the in the Amazon basin. There's practically no deforestation, there are no roads, there are no hydroelectrics, there's no uh, oil practically. There are threats of mining and this has to be dealt with. Dealt with in a rational way, controlling the mining and trying to do the best possible mining and the minimum amount of mining with the minimum of social and environmental negative impact. But otherwise it is not threatened. It is the area with the highest biodiversity and cultural diversity in the region and this is because of the soil formation because we're coming up close to the Andes and we also have the rock formation of the Roraima or the Guiana Shield. Because we have the mountains there of the Andes and we have the Guiana Shield formation, the clouds that are pushed or that come from the Atlantic Ocean across the, the Amazon as a leapfrog, the rains and then it's, it's, it's evaporated and it goes a bit further and it rains again, it's evaporated and it goes a bit further. When it arrives there, then it spreads out to the rest of the Amazon, up into the Andes, right up to the United States. So in this particular place, you have greater humidity. So with climate change, this is the area that will retain most humidity, consequently it will be less affected and it could end up being the last refuge of the Amazon. And to begin with in Colombia, the land belongs to the Indians and whatever, whatever is above the soil, but the subsoil belongs to the nation. And therefore you cannot forbid the nation to access what belongs to it. So mining in the Amazon right now could be rather chaotic or at least disordered and it could create a much greater negative impact than it would if we had territorial ordering, if we knew which were the sacred sites, recognize the most vulnerable environmental areas, uh, look at the key places for water or for where the animals reproduce or whatever it is, and then come in with standards that if mining comes in, uh, they will be careful with the environment, they won't hunt, they won't fish, there'll be a monitoring, uh, they would have a good agreement with the communities there that they wouldn't taste their, touch the sacred sites or the system of sacred sites or the places where they hunt and they fish. So it's really a question of order and of course of getting high standards with the mining and high responsibility in the companies. There's a lot of opposition among indigenous organizations to protected areas because they have been made over indigenous territories without recognizing indigenous rights. And therefore the indigenous people are left in the park to live in the same way as other animals can live, they can go and eat and hunt and fish, but they don't have really a right to govern their territory and therefore they are cons considered as second or third class citizens because they don't have a right to the territory which has belonged to them and which they have occupied and lived in for thousands of years. But if in other cases the indigenous people say, look, it wouldn't be a bad idea that you set a park here on top of our territory because this will, might guarantee that not only will you not or we will not lose the, the soil, but the subsoil will also be blocked or will also be protected against other people coming into mine or oil or whatever it is. It will just give us a guarantee and we come to an agreement when we set this up with the government that will be properly managed according to our own knowledge and articulated with the Western knowledge. I think this is perfectly possible and I think it could even be convenient. Begin when we talk about sacred sites, we have to talk about a system of sacred sites. How do they care, how do they make sure that the energy flows? And that is that during the different times of the year, you hunt more or less in different areas, depending if the fish are coming up to lay eggs, or if the animal are reproducing. You're careful that you do not interrupt the life cycle between these specific points of the planet, or points of the, of the territory. The sacred sites are critical points for this energy to flow. And I think I Amazonas is important in the area because we have learned over the years how to accompany indigenous people and uh, not only to take care or protect, it's not the right word, it's not taking care at all, they've always taken care of the rainforest, they've always lived with the rainforest as part of the rainforest, but how to set up their own local governments, how to set up their own uh, 
relationship with the outside world through education and health, maintaining, of course, their own traditional system of health and education, how to obtain certain income from the outside world, and they still live in 80% of their traditional ways of life. I mean, these people are very traditional and uh, there aren't that many external pressures really from the outside world. The people that set up Guama and Gaia, obviously, we were the ones that actually were directly involved in getting the 25 million hectares in pushing the laws that recognize their rights at, uh, at, in the ILO at constitutional level. And then we went down and we, the idea was to pass from the recognition of their rights or the indigenous people claiming their rights into exercising their rights. And once they start exercising their rights, we accompany them so they can set up their different uh, structures, be it government or analyze their territory in such a way, study the territory in such a way as they're looking into a traditional way of territorial ordering or how can we uh, uh, support them for them to pass their traditional knowledge to younger generations. And this has been done through the indigenous people setting up research programs with the young people asking the elders and led by the shamans. So uh, there have been different processes and I think that the importance of our work is that we were involved in getting the land, we were involved in looking at the laws and then we got involved in accompanying them for the last 20 years in putting this into practice in such a way that now the government recognizes the, their governments as public entities. Uh, they have set up systems for decentralization which have become part of the structure of the state and now they are governing these territories I would say 50% of the 25 million hectares they were governing and we still have to cover the rest or they have to cover the rest and we will be supporting them. On the long run what we are achieving or what they are achieving and we are accompanying them in the process is that we will have probably not only 25 million hectares but going across the border uh, in collaboration with the Instituto Socioambiental in Brazil and other colleagues we will probably be able to protect between 70 and 100 million hectares in the northwest Amazon, which is perhaps one of the most important areas to protect in the Amazon.